Shall we get started? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, um, I hope people can hear me on Zoom as well. Um, do, do write on chat if you cannot. Um, so I don't have too many announcements to make for today. Um, essentially, yeah, uh, the next assignment is due next week. And I hope things are going well. We have office hours also today. So if you have any questions, come to the office hours. Um, I, I wanted to ask before, actually, before we start, uh, how do you feel the, the class is going? Am I going too fast, for example, through the course or too slow? I, is, is the pace right for everyone, sort of? Who, who's feeling uh, I'm going too fast? Who's feeling I'm going too slow? A bit more engagement. Who's, who's, I want to see some, some opinions, kind of. So is, is it about right, at least? <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, so sounds good, sounds good. So, so do, do let me know if you have yeah, any, any kind of like feedback on that. Um, so it's just, a, just a, bi a brief recap of the ideas from last week before we go into, into kernel methods today. So, so last time we were speaking about support vector machines and, and how, we can, how we can build um, linear classifiers that are much more sophisticated than perceptron and basically compute the maximum margin. They, they, they compute a separating boundary that, that maximizes the distance between the nearby points. So that was last time with support vector machines. We find a line that maximally separates between groups of points. So we have a group of points. So they, these are pluses and minuses and we found a line that that maximized the closest distance to any any of these points this is what we were talking about last time with support vector machines we find this this uh, maximally separating line so um so today we're going to talk about kernel methods and we see how how we can extend this idea with support vector machines to to, to fix some of the issues they had. So let, let, let's have a look. So uh, to, to even learn nonlinear ma mappings in particular. So, so, uh, so in particular, uh, the, the, the previous algorithms like support vector machine and perceptron were linear models, what we're talking about. So they, they have very nice advantages. They're very simple. They're easy to understand. Uh, they, they have a few para fewer parameters. And um, yeah, we, we, we can sort of like, they, they even have generally good behavior in terms of like convergence. One of the disadvantages though is that they, they of course, they, they learn a very simple decision boundary. So, so of course this works well for when the, on our data is linear separable, but, but what if it's not? What if, what if our data is not linear separable? What do we do in that case? How do we, how do we, how do we learn a classifier, a good classifier that separates between the data points? So one, one, one really key solution is to, is to use a kernel. And this is what we're gonna talk about today, one of, one of the topics, is, is basically how, to, how do we build, how to extend the support vector machines to also use a kernel, and we'll see shortly what that means. So, um, so one of the key things, of course, when we have a, a data that is non-linear separable is that we have to use a non-linear model. If the data is not linear separable, we have to use a non-linear model. And um, of course, we can still fit a linear model to, uh, to the data, but of course, it will make errors and mistakes. So, so we want to do better than that. So, so what do we do? That's the, that's the question. So, um, so one option is here, can we somehow transform the data such that it becomes linear separable? We do some kind of like transformation to the data points. So th th this is the key idea that we're going to talk about today. How do we do this? How do we transform data so that it becomes linear separable? So let's look at this, da this data here. So, so we have two classes, the blues and the reds. Are they linear separable? Is, th is there a line that can separate the two of them? No. no. Yeah. So um, what if we do a transformation to this? What if we... We take our, so these are points in 2D, so these are x's, x1 and x2. And what if we put a transformation phi that looks like this? We take the first coordinate squared, the, 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 the second coordinate also squared, and in the middle here we have square root of 2, x1, x2, for example. This is how the data will look like in, in this, after this transformation. So, so the, the, uh, what's important is that the points around the origin roughly stay there but a point on the outside 
get mapped to um, to one of these quadrants. Because and what this is happening because these these numbers become positive when we raise into the power of two. So the first answer that I mentioned. So they, they, uh, even though the, the, these axes could have been negative initially, they become positive. So that's why they all get shifted to one of the quadrants. Is this like adding or producing a third feature out of the existing one? Yes, exactly. So you add more features. Now, now we're in a 3D space. We're not in a 2D space anymore. We add more features. And they can be different. They're not the same anymore, these features. It's not just that we added an extra feature. We also changed the other ones. So we all, all of them can be transformed, these three features. A question, yeah. Is there like a good way to figure out like how to transform it to like affect linearly or separate it? There's some uh, multiple ways to do it. Um, how to, to get some kind of intuition on this, you can get, but it's not easy. It's um, we can uh, we can discuss a bit about it. I I think you have to understand the data and sometimes e even so so in what happens in most cases is that even this if your problem originally was high dimensional was th if this was in 10 dimensions it would have been hard to visualize it in the first place to see how to move things around so so in short to your answer like is there a way to the question was is there a way to know what transformation to apply and um in, it's it's hard in, in general, but uh, but there's some rules of thumb. We kind of like go to some of the kernels later on today, and and and, and I'll show you a bit. So, some kernels have more, let's say, power than others, um, and there's some kernels that even lift the data into an infinite number of dimensions. So so we'll we'll, we'll go to that. So so you'll yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have, I, th there isn't, uh, it's not that I don't have it, there isn't um, an easy way to find all the transformations for any kind of problem though, in general. It just, there isn't, yeah. Um, um, but this is the key idea. So, so going back, this is the key idea. We're trying to find a transformation so that in this, in this high dimensional space, the problem becomes easier and it becomes linearly separable. So now, so now we have a hyperplane that is linear it's a linear hyperplane here that, that can separate the data points. And this wasn't possible before. Okay. Um, so this is another example, again, with, with data points. Again, we have pluses, we have other uh, two classes, the, the class one and class two. Um, after we, we convert them to a different kind of uh, coordinates, with and, and this, is a, this is actually in 2D now, we're still in 2D, we did not uh, increase dimensionality. But we change the we did apply the transformation. Now you see this is a uh, linearly separable. So um, so all the points uh, become uh, yeah uh, get close to here. So so th th this transformation, for example, is um, if you take again just the, just the absolute value, for example, on each on each dimension again. So 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 if you take it, instead of x1 and x2 you take the absolute value of x1 absolute value of x2 or some kind of norm then that that this 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 would work because again these points on the negative side become positive yeah uh, another some more examples so so for example here these points are not only separable we find the transformation that lifts them into into a 3d space and then they become linearly separable. So we have a, we have a plane. S same for these uh, data points here. We, ha we have a separating plane once we lift them into higher dimensions, and so on. And this is the view. This is the view from the side. This is the view from the top. So again, you see th these are in the center. Once we lift them up, we apply the transformation. We um, these become linearly separable with the plane. So. Um, yeah, this is how, kind of how you can, you can imagine how these uh, is like a piece of paper, and you can basically wrap them, wrap it around, and and that that uh, that makes makes these points linearly separable afterwards. Once you turn from this to that, for example, does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. So so the idea is ma so mathematically now, how do we do this? Is that we take our feature vector x, which, which was in d dimension, so x1, x2, up to xd, and we move it to a higher dimensional space, phi of x. So then the idea is that we're going to use phi of x instead of x as our feature vector. So, so this, this, is, this is it, essentially. We, we, we use phi of x instead of x. So, 
So for example, for, for a quadratic feature transformation mapping, for example, a quadratic function would look like this. So we, we have x, and this was initially x1, x2, xd, and this becomes, so we have a, a dummy coordinate 1 here, then 2x1, 2x2, 2x3, 2xd, and then these terms, like you know x1 squared, x1, x2. So we have uh, on the diagonal, for example, we have x, x is squared, on the, on the off diagonal, we have cross terms between x, x1, x2, x2, x1, and so on. So this is, so you can see how this is, this is much higher dimensionality. This has like d squared elements plus another d here plus another one. So, so this, uh, this has many more dimensions than, than we had initially than d. It's around d squared. Um, and the reason, and, and this is, a, for example, a, 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 a choice that is quite often used, and, and it's used like this because we we'll see shortly because the math works out quite well with these with these particular pairs. Um, but this is an example of a, of a transformation. So, um, so yeah. So so and, and there's a lot of like uh, feature combinations we can do. Like, like this is an example. We can do many other kinds of uh, transformations. Um, and notice how these terms x1 x2 and x2 x1 are the same actually so 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 they are redundant for example here and and and, um, and they, they repeat so um do you think this can be a problem for the for the algorithm if they repeat what, what do you think some ideas it's the computations that we don't need to repeat right so if we have a way of saving it and reusing things we recognize they're the same it should mm -hmm. reduce our runtime mm-hmm mm-hmm Interesting, interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other ideas? Can this be a problem? Or are we gonna be fine if, if, we, if they repeat? So, uh, yeah? Yeah. Maybe vector for the the same value. Say that again. Maybe vectors of x one x two would be vectors. X one x two would be vectors. No, uh, they they they're scalar values. They're scalars. They're not vectors. Yeah. X, x, all the x's are are scalars here. Uh, the, the this one this bold x is a vector. Of, uh, we'll see. We'll see later. So so I actually. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit ambiguous. It, it, it won't cause trouble, but, uh, but it can lead to overfitting. For example, if you have too many of these, in general, too many of these uh, uh, features that, that would repeat, for example, in general, in ML, they, they could overfit. But, uh, but we're, not gonna, we're not gonna address that. But I just wanted to make you aware that th th this is, um, yeah, something that happens. Um, so what are the pros and cons of doing this, of mapping uh, to a high dimensionality. So one of the pros, uh, pro, uh, like advantages is that, for example, you can, you can, uh, you can make the problem easier. You can then find the linear uh, separation, which, which you do, didn't have initially. So that's one of the ad main advantages. And some disadvantages, for example, are, first of all, computational. Now, if we work in a high dimensional space, we require much more compute, uh, c computation complexity to, to go through all of those elements. So it increases our, our runtime of the algorithm and our compl the complexity of the algorithm. And even the, the, me the memory requirements, for example, now we have to store much larger, much larger vectors, much larger matrices and so on. So, um, so that's one disadvantage. And also overfitting. So overfitting can happen um, if we have many more features and, and lots more parameters and, and too few examples to train from. So, um, so, 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 so in this lecture, we're mostly going to focus on the computational part, and we're not going to try to fix the second problem uh, in the lecture for now. Uh, and, and actually, we, we probably won't have time to go through course on how we fix the second problem, but I can tell you briefly that you can regularize. What, what, how, this is how what we were doing earlier with least squares, for example. We, if, if a model overfits, what we do is we regularize it. We put some kind of norm, like we, we try to also minimize a norm in the, in the weights or the parameters of, of the model. So, so we can do like a regularized version of an SV, SVM, for example, kernel SVM. But we're not gonna do that in the course. Um, but it, yeah, uh, this, this is a research area. Again, you can, uh, th there's quite a lot of stuff to read. We're gonna do this though. So how do we, um, yeah, we'll see shortly how do we deal with this. Um, 
Because what's going to happen, if you remember, what we were doing in, in support vector machines, that we were doing this operation a lot. We're taking our inputs x, we're multiplying them by the weight w, and adding the bias b. So w and b are our parameters that give us this line. This line was w x plus b equals 0. This is the separating line we had. But now, instead of x, we replace it with phi of x. So now we have, we're have working in, in a high dimensional feature. So now this will become w times phi of x plus b equals 0 in a high dimensional space. This, 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 this will be our, our new separating line in a high dimensional space. This will become a W times phi of x, because now we, we work in a higher dimensional space. Does it make sense? Um, so, so of course, so, so, so I'll, uh, we'll talk about kernel methods today and how, how this works. And, and the idea is that they use a special type of mapping function. So we have to choose a particular phi function in, in a special way. So, um, so we have to choose a phi, a function of phi, this, this function, such that that lifts us to a high dimensional space, uh, but also that ensures the computation is still going to be easy. So we also want to do an easy computation. And in particular, we want to be able to do these, these inner products easily between, phi, uh, between two vectors, phi of x and phi of z. So we want to do that inner product. We'll see why we need that. Um, so. And we'll have to rewrite our, our, our model so that, um, because you see when, when we do this, phi of x times w plus b, we don't like this operation because this one is in a high dimensional space. We'll try to rewrite it in such a way that we multiply between uh, two phi's instead. And we'll see how, yeah, and we'll, we'll see again why, why we'll do that. Um, So let, let, let's see our example in, in earlier we gave with this particular phi. Is this like a special function? Can we compute uh, how can we compute phi of x times phi of z easily? How do we uh, how how easy? Let's see how easy is it to compute that. So if you do phi of x, the inner product between the two vectors. These these are uh, these are now two vectors that are high dimensional. So these these are these are three dimensional. Three three uh, it's a three by one and three by one. So that uh, so this is. A product of three elements, uh, of, vect of vectors with three elements. Sorry. So, so you see how they 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 multiply. Uh, x one multiplies with z one. X one squares with z one squared. The middle term with the middle, and and the right with the right. This is an inner product. It's, it's always pairwise. The uh, the the products. And we get this, which we can be rewritten as x one times z one plus x two z two squared, which is x times z squared. So you see, so what happened is that we, we were able to, it seems that the, the inner product between these high dimensional vectors now, phi of x and phi of z, is actually much easier than we thought initially. It's just the inner product between x and z squared. So basically to compute this inner product, all we have to do is do the inner product in x and z which is a scalar, this will be, give us a scalar, and we raise to the power of two, and that's it. So, so it's almost the same as, as the, so the, the, the amount of computation power that we need to compute this, it's almost the same as the, the one for x of z. So this, we'll see, this is an example of a kernel function, because now, uh, instead of having to do an inner product in a high dimensional space, we do it much easier, in, uh, with, with a much simpler expression, that is much, much easier to compute. And this is a kernel, it's, it's a function between two vectors. And it gives us exactly that in a product. Um, let's see another example. So, so that that function we we gave earlier with a quadratic function. Um, so we have all the all these terms. X x one uh, x is squared uh, cross terms x one x two x two x one and so on, and we're doing the inner product between the uh, phi of x and phi of z. So what does this look like? So, so we just multiply, pairwise multiply all these terms. 1 plus x1 is the 1 and so on. Plus uh, 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 these ones squared and, and, and all, all these cross terms. And what we get is 1 plus 
sum over two sums over x's and z's and and and, and pairwise terms x d x d x z d z e so this simplifies if you do the math this simplifies to one plus two x times z and this is a dot product between x and z plus dot product between x and z squared so this is a one plus x uh, dot product z squared so it's much simpler than we thought to, to multiply multiply two of these vectors in the high dimensional feature um, and this is this is the case because we well this th these are some uh, sort of special functions that allow us to do the computation much much easier do we have any questions so far does this make sense and what i showed earlier yeah Not necessarily all transformations will be simplified like this. Yes, yes. So we have to look for these special transformations, special functions that, that allow us to do uh, a simplified computation. Yes, yes. But in general, not, not for all phi's, this will, this will be the case. Yeah. yeah. So ideal goal is to you know, get a simplified function which requires about as much computation as the original x times z. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, 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 exactly. So that's the idea because otherwise imagine if you were to do a dot product between this and in a d squared dimensions it's, it's much more expensive. complex more expensive so 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 what would be the complexity of doing the dot product in this original dimension what, what would be the computation complexity yeah 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 say, say it louder yeah yeah um is it is it just this uh yeah actually it is yeah it is it is because uh, the, the length of this is d squared so we have to do d squared operations to do all the pairwise multiplications and we have to sum them all together at the end so we have to do at least d, uh, an order of d squared uh operations whereas here we just do d d um, so we multiply all the d's with all the d's and then we add one this is a scalar and we just do one more operation so so that's all the d instead of d squared and the other and the other advantage is that we don't have to store these in memory we don't have to even compute these features to start with and we'll see shortly um so it's also a memory advantage so so i want to clarify that the kernel of what we're talking about is not the mapping function phi um it is actually associated with the mapping function the, uh, but it's not it's, it's not that it's it's basically um uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do a formal definition later but essentially the kernel is basically is basically this is something that, that allows us to compute the product of of, of phi of x and phi of z Th that would be the kernel but it's not the, the, the function phi it's not the same as, as function phi So now, so now the question is, uh, given this, how do we rewrite the SVM model to use um, the kernel now? So now this is what we're going to talk about. So, um, so, so let's do a quick refresher. So what was the um, optimization function for SVMs from last time? So, so we were saying in the, in the primal form, at least, that we, we minimize the norm squared of the parameters W and uh, subject to a constraint and the constraint says that the the prediction uh, times the label this is this is the prediction or the or sort of like the activation let's say let's call it actually let's call it the activation times the label has to be have to have the same sign or has to be at least greater than or equal to one um, so so if, if now if we wanted to use a new feature space with phi we simply replaced x with phi of x. But this is literally all we do. Um, but can, can you foresee some problems we're going to encounter if we do this, if we do just this? So what, what, what's going to happen if we, if we do that? Yeah, I'm going to start in terms of doubling the 
will increase. The number of uh, so the dimensionality of W will increase. Now we have, uh, for example, d squared uh, elements in W instead of just d, because again, th th this W now would be in a higher dimensional space. It will be a hyperplane. It won't be a, a line, for example. So, so that's one thing. Yes. And also, the the computation will be much more expensive. Again, it will be in that larger square, so it will take longer to do and more expensive to do these these uh, inner products. Um, and imagine again, imagine uh, these original X's were for an image, for example. Imagine you were applying this on an image, on on one which has w one megapixel image has one million, um, one million X's, for example, one million pixels. So now, uh, if if you do a quadratic, for example, increase like you'll get a million, one million squared, which will be much higher than what computers can normally do. So, so, so this, is, this is where it becomes quite important. Um, so, so it doesn't look that easy to rewrite this. But if you remember, we were talking last time that th there's a way to rewrite the SVM with a dual formulation. And the dual formulation, which is below here, oh, no, sorry, the, it, it's above, uh, but also below. Um, this one does not make use of W's anymore. It just gives you the solution in terms of uh, in terms of cross variance terms between x uh, between x m's and x n's. You multiply by the labels. Sorry, you multiply by the labels y. I actually have a a pointer. Great. So you have the uh, you have the cross terms, the x's. You multiply by the labels, and we have these parameters alpha. And this is what we have to optimize, the alphas here. Um, and subject to alpha, uh, subject to, the, to this, uh, to alpha times the, times the labels equals zero, um, the sum of all of that. So, so you see, the, the, the first thing is that we don't see any W here, any W and any B at all in this, in this dual formulation. And in addition, when we, when we recast this uh, to the kernel version, so now these become phi of xm and phi of xn. Um, we'll see, we, this looks awfully familiar what we were seeing earlier when we basically were doing the, these, uh, these inner products between, between these vectors. And we will see how we can actually apply the well, so-called kernel trick and we can do it with a kernel. So that, that's, that's the idea. So we use this dual form and we get a solution to the alphas and, and then we can uh, Get, we can estimate the W's after that. Um, so, um, so if you remember that uh, in the dual form, the way we were making a prediction was if, if we fit a model in the dual form, in the SGM model, the way we would do a prediction is by computing the activation and taking the sign, and that's a prediction, and then, um, we get the parameters W as a linear combination of, of our vectors with some weights. These are the vectors, these are the y's are the labels, and the alphas are the weights. So, so the solution is a linear combination of, of our input vectors. So, so if you do the prediction on, on an instance in the new feature space, so now if you, if you use our new feature space, again, we simply replace all the x's with five x's. And again, we, we get, we get a, a y's, which is a sign of um, this sum, sum over like uh, alphas, y's, phi's, because we have to replace w with this particular form in blue. So that, that, that's where we get this from. Multiply by phi of x prime, uh, our x prime becomes phi of x prime plus b. So notice again how this, we again we get an inner product between the vectors in the high dimensional space. We always get this, an inner product of uh, vectors in high dimensional space. And this we replace with a kernel function. And the kernel is very fast to compute. It's much faster than, than doing the inner product directly in the high dimensional space. And they give you exactly the same result. Because we choose a particular phi, the reason why is because again, we choose a particular phi for which we know the kernel and, um, and for which we, si we, we simply uh, compute a kernel function. And, um, so this is another visualization of what is happening. So again, so we, we our kernelized SVM prediction enables us to learn a nonlinear boundary in, in our original space. This is the original space, the lower dimensional original space. By simply lifting our data points into a high dimensional space, 
where now they are linearly separable. So, so they are basically lifted in a high dimensional space where, where you can find a linear separation, which you couldn't find before. Do you have any questions so far on, on these? I'll stop for a second. Does this make sense? With the dual form and uh, and the lifting into with the phi. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. So an example of a kernel we saw earlier is this one, for example, where k of x and z is equal to dot product between x and z squared. And 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 this is the the corresponding feature function. You notice how th these are different functions. These are this is a different function from this one. So, um, uh, but they are associated with each other. So l l let's look more theoretically at the difference. So, so the, the function phi, the, the feature mapping function, is a function that takes our inputs, uh, our inputs x, our input space x, and turns it into high dimensional space f. So, so this, is, this, this is a phi goes from x to f, whereas the kernel takes two inputs from x and, and uh, so this is a, the kernel takes two inputs and returns a, a, a real number, which is the value of, uh, of that particular kernel. So it's always the scalar. And, 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 the, and the kernel function, again, and the definition is, is literally this, is that it computes a dot product between phi of x and phi of z for a particular phi. So, um, so notice they are very different. So, so the, the kernel always returns a real number, whereas phi returns a high dimensional vector. Um, so, and, and notice that w again, once w once we have a kernel, again we don't need to know phi and even compute this. So, so if we have a kernel function, we don't need to even know what, uh, often what the corresponding phi is to actually implement uh, implement um, the support vector machine algorithm. Um, and we see that for some kernels, uh, some more tricky kernels, even like the a Gaussian kernel, for example, uh, we do not know what phi is. We, it's, it's not easy to express it analytically uh, because it has an infinite number of dimensions. Well, well and we won't go into that, but it's, it's, uh, it, the idea is that we don't need to actually know the mapping function. We just need to know the kernel and, and, to, and to know that it exists somehow. Um, but can, can, how do we know that we always have a function that, that corresponds to a kernel? So can any function be a kernel generally? Um, so a function can be a kernel if, if we have a suitable mapping function, if we find a particular mapping function such that, so th if there exists a, a feature space phi such that k of x and z equals an inner product in this for a particular phi. So th this is when it's a kernel. It, th this has to exist. It has to exist a, f uh, a function phi such that uh, the kernel gives, gives us that. Um, so this, this now becomes a dot product in this in this higher dimensional um, um, space. Um, so um, there's something called the, what is called the Mercer's conditions, and basically th this tells us that when a particular um, function can be a kernel, uh, and 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 the kernel k, so the, uh, any function can be a k can be a kernel if it satisfies this condition. So. So the k has to be positive semi-definite. Uh, I.e., so first of all, for all all types of functions uh, that are square integrable f. So so here, the, uh, such as the variance of the function here is finite. So the variance of the function has to be finite. We have we we need it to be s uh, positive semi-definite. So this uh, and the formula for that is basically the, um, if you take two vectors x and z, then and you and you multiply pre-multiply the kernel by f of x and the post multiply by f of z, then this product has to be zero when you integrate it. Has to be always greater than zero for, for any uh, data point of x and z. So for any x and z, this has to be greater than or equal to zero. This is called the Mercer's condition. Um, does it make sense? So th th this is how we know, and it's, this is useful because this is how we know the function of our function k can be a kernel, can be expressed as a kernel. Um, f for ha have any of you encountered this uh, concept positive semi-definite for matrices, for example, when we have a matrix that is positive semi-definite? Uh, sorry. I don't 
You don't remember, yeah. I so don't remember you don't remember. So we did not actually. Uh, I, I mentioned it once, but we didn't. I didn't actually go through this. But essentially, a matrix that is positive. A matrix is a linear transformation. So a matrix is always a transformation in, in linear space. So so it's positive uh, definite if all the eigenvalues are positive. That's one way to think about it. And what that means is that the way it's it transforms those vectors, it doesn't flip them around. Because if you have a negative eigenvalue, it means one of the eigenvectors gets flipped on the negative side, basically, uh, in the transformation. So it, does, it never flips around, things around. It's always positive. It's, it's always, it can move them to the side, but it never turns them negative. So, and this is the case, so all eigenvalues have to be positive. Um, So it is. So th so th uh, so the um, kernel k has to be positive semi-definite, and semi-definite simply means um, e uh, uh, yeah greater than or equal to zero. So so actually there's there's a, there's a typo there, but positive definite means it's stronger than yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes yes yes. It has to be some. Exactly, it has to be something positive, like like x squared is a positive, for example, like um, um, quantity. Um, and in general, again, it it yeah, it, it it means that the transformation has yeah has to not flip things around because otherwise, if if it, for any vector it flips it around on the other side to the negative side, then it's yeah. And this is because it has to be a kernel has to be a measure intuitively it has to be a measure of distance. In, in the high dimensional space. And this is uh, always positive. So that's, w that's why we require it to be positive, semi-definite, and these, these to be positive, these transformations, because it has to be a measure of distance in a high dimensional, in the high dimensional space, lifted space. If, if yeah, uh, this is roughly the intuition of where it comes from. But again, th this is more formal, uh, th this, this course is uh, in, like vector spaces and that kind of stuff that we're not we're not covering that but you can uh, study these in much more depth sort of but uh, we're not we don't have time to cover that in the course um and yeah this is a this is also called like an inner product space in the high dimension and so on but um um okay so 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 moving on uh any other questions actually before okay um yes a question here yeah Um, it, it has to be so, so so it's it's any function th f which has finite variance so basically what what is saying is that um uh, Mes is saying that for any function f that has finite variance and any vectors x and z this has to hold so th so for 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 a p for for a kernel to be positive semi definite for, uh, for all f that satisfy uh Finite variance constraint, yeah. Any f with finite variance, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so how, in general, how we construct these terms and how we prove often how we prove something is a kernel is actually because this condition is quite hard to to prove uh, for for many many complex kernels. It's actually quite hard to prove this, but. Uh, how people generally do it is that is by using these properties is for example if you know that if two kernels k1 and k2 uh, if these functions are kernels two kernels then, then we can then the sum will also be a kernel so it will satisfy Mercer's condition a scalar product between a kernel and and the constant will also be a kernel and satisfy Mercer's condition and also the direct product will also be a kernel so um so, so all we have to do is probably like uh, in, in general is to prove uh, these conditions for simple kernels and then we can construct more complex ones using these, these properties. Um, so let's see, how, how do we prove, for example, this? How do we prove the sum, that the sum of two kernels is also a kernel? It's actually not too complicated. So if we do the, if so we're just proving that property. So if we do the integral, over f of x, so, so, so this, is, this is how we start with it. We start the integral of f of x, kernel, f of z, dx dz. So we write that x, k of x, uh, comma z is, is a 
sum of two kernels. So we put that inside the integral. And we know with the integral that we can, uh, we can uh, break it apart because basically we can break a sum apart. Um, and th this is a, is a sum of two integrals now. Integral over f, k1, f of z, f of x, k2, f of z. And, um, and we know that each of these, because uh, k1 is a kernel, k2 is a kernel, these have to be greater than zero, uh, each of them. So that's why how we know then the whole sum has to be greater than zero. So this is how we, so we just proved uh, that the sum of two kernels is also a kernel with matrix condition. Um, and the same thing you can think of how you do also with the, um, the constant, with the multiplying by constant. Again, the, the constant would come out of the integral and uh, this would, would still work. And it has to be positive, of course, the constant. Yeah. Um, so, so these are a few examples of kernels. So for example, this is a linear kernel where k of x comma z is equal to simply a dot product between x and z. We also have quadratic kernels, like for example here, k of x comma z is equal x dot product z squared, or, or even one plus x, com x dot z squared. And we saw previously, we actually saw this, this, uh, this function earlier when we had all those like d squared dimensions, so we have sort of feature, feature function for this one. There's also polynomial kernels more generally, so, uh, so the same thing, but instead of power two, we raise the power of d, all of these properties. And we also have uh, something called a Gaussian kernel, RBF kernel, which is basically, we take the, uh, for two vectors x and z, we take the, uh, the, the difference and we compute the norm of the difference and we scale it by a parameter. And, uh, and then we take the exponential of that, of that difference. But remember, th this, this is a scalar, the norm of of uh, the difference now becomes a scalar, and we just have a working like with scalars. We multiply by a scalar, and we raise to the to e to the power of that. Um, quick question: What is um, the feature function phi for the linear kernel? What what, what is the mapping function for for the linear kernel? Some ideas. Let, 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 let's, let's, let's think about it. So um, what was the definition of, of K? So K of x, z, it was equal to what? What was the definition of the kernel? Yes. Phi x dot product phi z. This is a dot product here. So if we know that k of x comma z is equal to x dot product z, what could be a phi function? What is it? Identity. Identity. Yes, exactly. So, so if phi is just identity function, then that that that's 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 the corresponding for the linear kernel. This is the corresponding phi, mapping function phi for this. Because phi would just be identity. Uh, so phi of x is equal to i of x equals x. So phi of x equals x. So this is this identity matrix, but we can just yeah, write it like this. Phi of x equals x. So that's that's the, that's, the, that's that's the mapping function for a linear kernel. So so the identity function doesn't doesn't do anything. It doesn't lift in a higher dimensional space. It keeps it in the same space, and doesn't change the ve the transfer the vectors. Um, we saw the function for this one for the quadratic kernel. We saw it. It was uh, what was it? Do you remember? It was 
x1 squared yeah yeah x1 squared uh, square root of 2 x1 x2 x2 squared yeah so so that so that that's uh, for example for for the quadratic term um, again we'll see for this for the gaussian kernel uh we're not going to this but um the phi has infinite dimensions so so it's an infinite uh, it's lifting the space in an infinite number of dimensions so it's harder to write it out but we're not, we're not going through that uh, in this lecture uh, but this, 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 this will be the phi for this particular Gaussian kernel. Um. Mm. Oops. Um. Why don't we take... Um, no, actually, l l let's go 10 more minutes and then I'll take a break. Um, so, because we've, we're almost finished here. Uh, so, one sec. So, um, so, if you remember from the passage from algorithm we, we discussed two lectures ago, L l l let's do a quick recap of what the perceptron was doing because we, we're going we're gonna to see shortly how we can turn the perceptron into a kernelized perceptron. We use the k this kernel trick to turn it into a kernelized perceptron. So the perceptron, if we recap the old one, what it was doing is that you simply go through all the, so we start from here, we go through all the data points in our data set. We compute the activation, some kind of like prediction almost, but, uh, but it's a continuous prediction, not a binary prediction. So we take the inputs axis, we multiply by the weights W, add the bias, and then we store that as an activation. And we compete the activation with, this, with, the, with the label, with the label Y. And for all the mismatches, this is when uh, this is negative. This, this, is, this meant they did not match. They had a different um, sign. Then, then we basically update the weights uh, and we add um, X's times Y's, and we update the, the, the also the biases. Um, this is what the old perceptron was doing. So, so now if we if we do if we apply the kernel trick, what we do instead of instead of X's, now we have phi of X's. Now we're working with the higher dimensional uh, mappings. So, so all we did was to replace the X's with phi of X's here, here, and here, in the activation and in the update of the weights. Yeah. Um, now the, again, but we have the same problem with uh, computing these because these are in high dimensions. So how do we use the kernel trick? We have to sort of get, get uh, simplify this. So so notice how this update equation works. We have w that updates to w plus y phi of x. And notice that at any time these weights will be a linear combination of of phi of x's. So basically, at any time because we, we, we assume we start with weights that are zero, for example, and we always keep, uh, all we do is always add some kind of phi of x, either with plus one, uh, with a plus one or minus one. Uh, uh, this is the label. So, um, so the weights will always be some kind of combination, linear combination of phi of x's, of, the, of these vexes. And, and, um, and these, um, and, uh, Forget about these for now. Th these, are, these, are, these are the weights from, um, we'll see shortly, from, from the soft. Uh, um, um, yeah, th 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 these, are, these are the weights from the, from the dual form of the, of the SVM. Um, I, I probably should add a few more notes here, but basically, um, we, um, or I should say the, the active, um, no, th these are these are the biases. Really, should be B. Uh, but um, but basically, what what happens is that if we write it as a, if we write these as a linear combination, oh no, sorry. So these these alphas are these weights for for these five x's that, that we've been adding so far. So so then if if we rewrite it like this, these weights as as a linear combination of five times alphas, then what we get is that the activations are a sum of 
of the weights, this will initiate the weights, which are now a sum of a linear combination of phi of x's, which with these alphas, times again phi of x's. So now we have exactly the, the form for the kernel, for the kernel that, we, that we were looking for initially. When we have uh, inner products between two of these high dimensional vectors, we can replace this with, with the kernel between xm and xn. So our uh, so our alphas are are the w are the old w's but now they, these are, these have become the new w's in a high dimensional space. And we update we do the same thing we do we update the um, the alphas and we update the betas and uh, and the activations now use the kernel trick. So prediction again is 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 again it's very easy since the w our new w's are a uh, sum over. Um, over the high dimensional weighted vectors uh, weighted by alpha, then the prediction is basically um, uh, so this is a alpha, uh, sum of alpha times the kernel trick plus plus uh, plus b plus the bias. So the, if we take the sign, this will be our our new uh, prediction. Because remember the or the original prediction, the original activations were these were w times x plus b equals zero. So um, so this this now becomes that now uh, the, the, this product w x plus b becomes alpha k of x uh, uh, alpha times times k of x plus b. So um, so I'll take uh, let, let's take a eight minute break and we'll continue afterwards with the with naive base. And we won't have a quiz today. We're taking a longer break. We won't have a quiz because we have to go through some more material. Okay. How's it going? <laughs> That's good, yeah. Um, it's a second assignment, is that better? Yeah. It is easier, yeah. yeah. So the, yeah I, hear, I heard people saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sounds good, sounds good. Yeah. 